Charles and Ray Eames are among the most important designers of the 20th century. In the early 40s, the Eameses were the first to be able to design and mass produce molded plywood furniture with compound curves. In fact, their work came to the attention of the military early in World War II, and the Eameses were brought into the war effort to design molded plywood splints, stretchers, and airplane parts. The splints seen here in production. After the war, they continued their work in furniture design. To choose just four Eames furniture designs out of a hundred spread across four decades, the LCM molded plywood chair, 1946, the molded plywood screen, 1946, the Eames lounge chair and ottoman, 1956, the chaise, 1968. In 1949, they built their own home as part of the Arts and Architecture magazine Case Study House Program. They lived there the rest of their lives. The Eames House, as it is known today, is considered a classic of modern residential architecture. From 1943 to 1988, the home of the office of Charles and Ray Eames was this warehouse at 901 Washington Boulevard in Venice, California. Here, in addition to their furniture design, they wrote books, designed museum exhibitions, made films, created toys, and more. The achievements of Charles and Ray Eames are too numerous to offer a complete list here. And some, like Charles' incredible eye for photography, completely permeate the work. So a very few examples must suffice. The House of Cards, 1952. The India Report, 1958. The exhibition Mathematica, A World of Numbers and Beyond, 1961. Think at the IBM Pavilion at the New York World's Fair, 1964. Development of a design for a national aquarium, 1966. Charles's Norton Lectures in Poetry in 1970 and 71. The Computer Perspective Exhibition, 1971 the Copernicus Exhibition, 1972, the Franklin and Jefferson Exhibition, 1975. In 1950, the Eameses made their first film, Traveling Boy. From that point on, throughout their work, the films are a constant thread, a valued tool for communicating, teaching, recording, celebrating. Charles died in 1978. Their last film was completed the next year. Ray died in 1988 as she was completing the process of closing the office and cataloging their films and stills for the Library of Congress. During their lives, they made over 85 short films on subjects from toy trains to the laws of physics, from sea creatures to the world of Franklin and Jefferson. It is this work we celebrate in this series, the films of Charles and Ray Eames.
is your definition of design, Monsieur Eames? One could describe design as a plan for arranging elements to accomplish a particular purpose. Is design an expression of art? I would rather say it's an expression of purpose. It may, if it is good enough, later be judged as art. Is design a craft for industrial purposes? No, but design may be a solution to some industrial problems. What are the boundaries of design? What are the boundaries of problems? Is design a discipline that concerns itself with only one part of the environment? No. Is it a method of general expression? No, it is a method of action. Is design a creation of an individual? No, because to be realistic, one must always recognize the influence of those that have gone before. Is design a creation of a group? Very often. Is there a design ethic? There are always design constraints, and these often imply an ethic. Does design imply the idea of products that are necessarily useful? Yes, even though the use might be very subtle. Is it able to cooperate in the creation of works reserved solely for pleasure? Who would say that pleasure is not useful? Ought form to derive from the analysis of function? The great risk here is that the analysis may be incomplete. Can the computer substitute for the designer? Probably, in some special cases, but usually the computer is an aid to the designer. Does design imply industrial manufacture? Not necessarily. Is design used to modify an old object through new techniques? This is one kind of design problem. Is design used to fit up an existing model so that it is more attractive? One doesn't usually think of design in this way. Is design an element of industrial policy? If design constraints imply an ethic, and if industrial policy includes ethical principles, then yes, design is an element in industrial policy. Does the creation of design admit constraint? Design depends largely on constraints. What constraint? The sum of all constraints. Here is one of the few effective keys to the design problem, the ability of the designer to recognize as many of the constraints as possible, his willingness and enthusiasm for working within these constraints, the constraints of price, of size, of strength, of balance, of surface, of time, and so forth. Each problem has its own peculiar list. Does design obey laws? Aren't constraints enough? Are there tendencies and schools in design? Yes, but these are more a measure of human limitations than of ideals. Is design ephemeral? Some needs are ephemeral. Most designs are ephemeral. Ought design to tend towards ephemeral or towards permanence? Those needs and designs that have a more universal quality tend toward relative permanence. How would you define yourself with respect to a decorator, an interior architect, a stylist? I wouldn't. To whom does design address itself? To the greatest number? To the specialist or the enlightened amateur? To a privileged social class? Design addresses itself to the need. After having answered all those questions, do you feel you have been able to practice the profession of design under satisfactory conditions or even optimum conditions? Yes. Have you been forced to accept compromises? I don't remember ever being forced to accept compromises, but I have willingly accepted constraints. What do you feel is the primary condition for the practice of design and for its propagation? A recognition of need. What is the future of design?
How would you set about to measure the Earth with the mathematical knowledge and tools you already possess? A Greek named Eratosthenes did it 240 years before Christ. He was head of the great library of Alexandria in Egypt, a city built by the Greeks. He, like others, suspected that the world was round. After all, the sun and the moon were round. He had also noticed that the sun's rays fell in parallel lines. Greeks before him had divided the circle into degrees and had measured angles. With this information and a logical mind, he measured the Earth. Here is how. While visiting the city of Syene one midsummer's day, Eratosthenes noticed that the reflection of the sun could be seen in the bottom of a deep well. The sun was overhead, and the rays pointed to the center of the Earth. He remembered this, and on the next midsummer's day in Alexandria, he measured the shadow cast by an obelisk. Sunbeams travel in parallel lines, so the difference in angle had to result from the curvature of the Earth. If the angle was 1 50th of a circle, then the distance around the world must be 50 times the distance from Alexandria to Syene. With these simple tools, Eratosthenes made this almost exact measurement of the world more than 1,700 years before Magellan sailed around it. He was a friend of Archimedes. He was a mathematician and a poet, invented the sieve for finding prime numbers, was the first geographer, and corrected the calendar to the one we use today. About the turn of the century, the French mathematician Marie Camille Jardin stated, a simple closed curve in the plane divides the plane into exactly two domains. If we ask a young child to copy these forms, he is apt to produce a series of related blobs. And when he does, he is unconsciously recognizing the fundamental similarity between these shapes. Each one divides the paper into an inside part and an outside part. A point that lies in one area cannot get to the other, no matter how the curve is stretched. It is a simple closed curve, which means that it does not cross itself, and it ends at its beginning point. If it follows these rules, it will behave the same regardless of how it is distorted. Now it would be more difficult to tell if any given point lies inside the curve or outside. But there is a way. If a line is drawn from that point to the area beyond, and it crosses the curve an odd number of times, we find that the point lies inside. An even number of times it lies outside. What is true for the simple curve and its brotherly blobs may not be true for its more complicated cousins. A curve that crosses itself once behaves differently, and no matter how hard it tries, it cannot become a simple curve. This is just a taste of topology. Just as two plus three is part of arithmetic, and bisecting an angle is a part of geometry, so problems of inside and outside are a part of topology. think of symmetry, we usually think of a design balanced around a center line, or a folded ink blot, or a piece of architecture. We think of man as being symmetrical, yet he is only symmetrical the way some designs are. That is, he looks the same as his mirror image. There are many kinds of symmetry, and some things can be shown to be more symmetrical than others. One way to test for degrees of symmetry 
is to count the number of positions an object can take in a box that fits it perfectly. A man can fit in a man box only one way. But a card can fit in a card box four ways. Front out, front upside down, back out, back upside down. A solid with four equilateral triangles as faces, a tetrahedron, can fit in its box with any of its four faces up. And with each face up, it can turn in three positions. Three times four equal 12 positions. A cube has six faces, and each one up can take four different positions. It fits in its box 24 ways. A dodecahedron will fit in its box 60 ways. The number of ways suggests the degree of symmetry. Some things can take an infinite number of positions in their box. A cone is an example. If we put it in a cone box and mark a point, then move it halfway around, then half the distance to the starting point, then half again and again, we can keep halving forever, and the cone can take an infinite number of positions. The sphere is the most symmetrical of all. It can rotate into an infinite number of positions in an infinite number of ways. But trust the mathematician. He has a more precise way of measuring symmetry, a form of algebra called group structure. Still, fitting things in boxes is one way to gauge how much more symmetrical one thing is than another. There are many times when invisible connections link things together. When the variation of one thing determines the variation of another, then that connection is called a function. The size of the balloon is determined by the amount of air. The more air, the larger the balloon. The size, then, is a function of the amount of air. The height of a candle is such a direct function of time that the ancients measured the hours in this way. In one hour, the candle is one unit shorter. In two hours, two units. In three hours, three, and so forth. The candle gets shorter with time. The boy gets taller with time. His height is a function of time because it has a definite value at any instant. Your proper weight is a function of your height and the number to which the needle points is a function of your weight. Your weight is a function of gravity. The less gravity, as on the moon, the less weight. The speed of the locomotive is a function of the heat in the firebox, the position of the throttle, the diameter of the wheels, the grade of the track, and the direction and the velocity of the wind. It is not likely to depend on the beauty of the scenery or the color of the engineer's hair. Many laws of nature are statements of functional relationships. Functions are the beginning, and sometimes they are the goal of science. This is an old story, but it reminds us of the surprises we can get when even a small number like two is multiplied by itself many times. King Sharam of India was so pleased when his grand vizier Sisa Bendar presented him with the game of chess that he asked Bendar to name his own reward. The request was so modest that the happy king immediately complied. What the Grand Vizier had asked was this, that one grain of wheat be placed on the first square of the chessboard, two grains on the second square, four on the third, eight on the fourth, 16 on the fifth square, and so on, doubling the amount of wheat on each succeeding square until all 64 squares were accounted for. When the King's steward had gotten to the 17th square, the table was well filled. 
by the 26th square, the chamber held considerable wheat, and a nervous king ordered the steward to speed up the count. When 42 squares were accounted for, the palace itself was swamped. Now fit to be tied, King Sharam learns from the court mathematician that had the process continued, the wheat required would have covered all India to a depth of over 50 feet. Incidentally, laying this many grains of wheat end to end also does something rather spectacular. They would stretch from the earth, beyond the sun, past the orbits of the planets, far out across the galaxy to the star Alpha Centauri, four light years away. They would then stretch back to Earth, back to Alpha Centauri, and back to the Earth again. Photographic quarterly, Camera Work, was published by Alfred Stieglitz shortly after the turn of the century. The photographs, drawings, and articles by Stieglitz and his friends signaled photography's coming of age in America. Photography is an art, a step in learning, and an insight into the life and the things that surround us. Stieglitz described his own work as the exploration of the familiar. He said, I have found my subjects within 60 yards of my door. He favored any means that might free the photographer's whole energies so that they could be channeled in the direction of the decision, the picture itself. Since 1947, Edwin Land and Polaroid have pursued a central concept, one single thread, the removal of the barriers between the photographer and his subject. And now, a compact, folding, electronically controlled, motor-driven, single-lens reflex camera, capable of focusing from infinity down to 10 inches, has been developed to exploit integral, self-processing film units, which, when exposed, are automatically ejected from the camera with no parts to peel or discard, and whose final images emerge without timing in daylight, where the viewer can see them materialize within the same transparent, protective plastic cover through which the film was originally exposed. your left hand out. Place the camera across the palm. Grasp the rear of the viewfinder cap. Pull the camera into its erect position. To load, press and the door opens. Take the 10 picture film pack and push it all the way in. Close the door and automatically the cover sheet will be ejected from the camera. Now rest the camera against your chin. Bring your eye to the viewing lens. Place your thumb on the back of the lens board and your finger on the focusing wheel. Rolling left or right, to bring the scene into sharp focus from infinity down to 10 inches. When the correct moment comes, press the red electric shutter button, holding the camera steady until the film is out. In a situation where the light is faint, the electronic circuits will control exposures up to 14 seconds. Then the film is ejected.
The 10 bulb flash unit, five on each face, is installed by inserting the prong of the unit firmly into the opening above the lens. Select, focus, shoot. During the one and a half seconds after the shutter button has been pushed, and even during viewing, another story is going on inside the camera. This optical path from subject to eye is unique to this single lens reflex system. All elements are articulated to fold into a compact unit that folds flat. The four element lens collects the light, which bounces off of a permanent mirror to a fine Fresnel surface. It bundles the light and reflects it back again to the same mirror. The light leaves the interior of the camera through two astigmatism correcting slits bouncing off of an aspheric plastic mirror which focuses the image in space. It is this image that is seen through the eyepiece which is itself aspheric. When the picture is taken, the Fresnel moves, elevating the taking mirror so that the image that had fallen onto the retina of the photographer's eye is reflected onto the film. The camera gets a fresh power source within each fresh film pack, a four cell six volt battery made like ribbon and cut to size. Power and signals are transmitted throughout the camera. Each part of the system speaks to the other parts, getting their precise cues from a configuration of circuits that employs more than 200 transistors and as many resistors. These ultra miniaturized integrated circuits take control of events once the button has been pushed. The first signal energizes solenoid number one and closes the shutter on the lens and photocell. The blades are open when relaxed and in closing, activate the circuit that moves a small 12,000 RPM motor just seven revolutions, enough to both turn the mirror release cam and open a pair of contacts, stopping the motor just as springs take over to release the mirror Fresnel assembly and send it into taking position. The solenoid power is off, and as the lens shutter starts to open, so does the shutter in front of the photocell. The ambient light passes through the photocell lens, past the shutter blades, and strikes the photocell mounted on the main circuit board. The blades continue to open until light reaching the cell builds up enough voltage to trigger the shutter solenoid. The blades rush to the closed position, and the motor is signaled to start the processing cycle. The gear train moves the film pick forward, and the opacifier and reagents are spread between the photosensitive layers and the clear plastic of the film unit. In the meantime, the mirror is lowered and latched. In lowering, it advances the film counter. All power is down, relaxing the shutter to its open position. The exposed film, out of the camera, is now protected by the turquoise opacifier, which also carries the processing ingredients. The film is about one hundredth of an inch thick, Two-thirds of this is the transparent film cover and the black backing. The rest is the chemistry. Farthest from the cover are three color-sensitive layers, each with its complementary layer of dye developer. The untrapped dye developer will migrate to the positive to form the positive image. The process takes several minutes, and the picture will continue to mature for some time. The white titanium dioxide forms a luminous background for the metallized dyes. You can look at technology as a living tree, the trunk bearing branches, the branches leafing out. Or you can see it as a net, each knot tying up threads from many sides. But the human reality is more intricate than either one. We have been looking at one invention which began pretty purely out of the conception of a need the hope to change the person who takes pictures from a harried offstage observer into someone who is a natural part of the event. No single thread wove this invention. Not lens, not moving mirror, not film chemistry, not clever circuits. They are coordinate. Parts of a single strategy working together to protect and fulfill the original hope. This invention is finally a system. Call it a system of novelties. But even that is not enough. The camera enters the real world only once it is precisely manufactured in quantity. That process, too, reflects a civilized concern. It has its visual beauty. It rewards skill and care with immediate feedback. In the end, it links the inventors, the engineers, the workers, the distributors into one chain of craftsmanship. The user is the final link. 
the device helps meet the universal need to do things well. It offers, as a matter of course, a tool for supplying a rich texture to memory. More than that, thoughtful use can help reveal meaning in the flood of images which makes up so much of human life. We hope the user will fully complete the chain, gaining as much fun, as much sense of self, and as clear participation in the stream of human creativity as did Edwin Land and the team who first made SX-70. was close to the northernmost coast of Europe in the city of Torin, the birthplace of Nicholas Copernicus, that the King of Poland and the Teutonic Knights signed and sealed the Peace of 1466, which made West Prussia part of Polish territory. Copernicus grew up far from the centers of Renaissance innovation, and he was schooled in a world that still fitted the classifications of Aristotle. the sciences, and astronomy not least, were beginning to respond to the opportunities offered by the printing press. Copernicus and his contemporaries found themselves with new ways of access to the past. In their lifetimes, they put together a completely renewed picture, to us a much more familiar one, of what nature is and what learning and observation should be. Yet the training of this new generation had been everywhere much the same as Copernicus received in the university town of Krakow. Thank you. 
After leaving the Collegium Maius and before going on to his lifetime post as a canon of the Cathedral of Frambourg, Copernicus made a journey to study medicine and canon law in the university cities of northern Italy. I began to be annoyed that the philosophers had discovered no sure scheme for the movements of the machinery of the world. Therefore, I also began to meditate on the mobility of the earth. At Frombork, he had time, security, and a tower room to work in. And it was here that the bulk of his astronomical research was completed. At the same time, he had administrative duties on the cathedral estates and he put his knowledge of medicine and law at the service of the local community. He seems to have intended not to put his ideas into print until, in 1539, a young professor of mathematics named Joachim Bredicus made the journey from Wittenberg to interview him, bringing with him some of the latest and finest books in the field of astronomy. Bredicus printed the first account of the Copernican cosmology, in which each of the planets, by its position and order and every inequality of its motion, bears witness that the Earth moves. And it was Redicus who persuaded Copernicus to let him carry away the completed manuscript, after some last retouches, to the printer.
This one is going to have something to do with what I think of as the new covetables. Ray, who is my wife and not my brother, she was here last time, about a month ago her, had her car broken in. And Ray's car invites breaking in because it's, it's usually loaded with presents sort of to and from grandchildren, beautifully wrapped flowers, things to put flowers in, things of food and for picnics and stuff. We have a picnic every day at the office. And so any passerby that looks, they'd be in, you know, invited to break in. And it happened. They broke in. Well, we usually leave the office about 11 o'clock every night so that they had sort of plenty of time for this maneuver, but everybody in the office soon was found out. Everything in Ray's car had been strewn all over the lot. There wasn't much missing. I, I, I think it was a, a beautifully wrapped broken alarm clock that was being sent to a grandchild for further dismantling was the most important thing. <laughs> lost, and I regretted this very much. But while going around and picking these things up, I came upon a bolt of cloth. And this was really distressing, because it was that kind of a bolt of cloth. It was a bolt of wool. When you take hold of it, where you can feel the animal wax and oil in it somehow. It was a great bolt of cloth. What was shocking about it was that the guy hadn't thought enough of it to take it, if it wasn't. Uh, and that somehow or other, he had not a sufficient respect for a bolt of cloth to take it to his girl, his wife, mother, or whatever it is. And this, is this is really a, a, a shocking experience, because somehow or another, a bolt of cloth comes under that that sort of heading of goods, the kind of goods that, that people sort of lay great store in, the kind of things that you have a feeling of tremendous security about. And I don't know if you remember quite sort of what goods are, but this is the way a bolt of cloth looks. It's sort of, it, it's fascinating because it is goods. There's things about cloth, it reminds me of Mrs. Manley of the Manley party sort of crossing the, the desert, uh, Death Valley, when they were abandoned and going to face the Indians. She dressed up with every shred of cloth that she had because she, she couldn't afford to leave it, unlike the guy on the station. The, 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 the way cloth itself looks and packs and feels, it's not sort of just what you do with it and what you sew with it. The cloth, it takes sort of the place of a hank of rope. I, I don't know, we don't see ropes often in hanks anymore. I think clothesline comes in hanks and it comes in hanks that are sort of linked one to the other. And even that makes a kind of a perfect, you don't want to break into it. You want to keep a hank as it is or a reel of line. Line is marvelous. We haven't some of the halyard line here, but the great stuff. The way it comes in the package from the haberdasher or from the ship chandler or what it is, the way it wraps sort of the detail. These are, these are goods. It's sort of to be, be thought. A ball of twine. I mean, who would throw away a ball of twine? Because there is something special about that ball of twine before the moment that it sort of opened up and gotten into, because as long as it's somewhat of a seal, why it's, it's an object to, to hold on to. Even the way that marvelous iron thing that the twine goes in so the, that the string comes down and in a sense you think it's going on forever. A keg of nails. A keg of nails, when anything was broken into, why in the house somebody would always refer to it as breaking into the keg of nails. Boxes of candy are thought of as kegs of nails. But once into it, sort of the, the beautiful mass of stuff, which like a barrel of apples or a bushel of apples, you think is going to last forever. Because once you open a keg of nails, how can you run, run through it? Reams of paper. Haven't you dreamed of reams of paper? 
it's absolutely beautiful, beautiful, beautiful stuff. What, what you do with a ream of paper can never quite come up to what the paper offers <laughs> in, in itself. There's, there's, there's something about that broken package, you know, where the coroner is torn and that sort of in, invites you to come in it. And there's something about taking out that first sheet that sort of changes as the boxes of chalk. Now, chalk is never so wonderful as when it sort of lays in there the boxes. The boxes are very tiny. It wasn't easy to find a box of chalk these days. I tell you, sawdust and all. A cord of wood is one of the most covetable things that you can imagine at certain times. And again, there was always that moment when somebody eat first, eat into the cord of wood. The first one to take the, the piece out and it would start to tumble and before you knew it, the cord of wood was gone. 